This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Loctite's Pro Foam. Say no to inefficient and drafty. Say yes to Loctite's new Pro Foams. Loctite's Pro Foam line features three new products. The gaps and cracks and window and door items seal and insulate gaps and fit any standard foam gun applicator. Loctite's Fireblock Pro Foam fills gaps while resisting the migration of fire and smoke. Perfect for electrical, plumbing, and wherever a fire-resistant foam is needed. Say yes to Loctite's new Pro Foams. Say yes to Loctite. Visit loctiteproducts.com for more information. Hey, podcast listeners, be sure to check out Fine Home Building's e-learning opportunities. We've created a special discount coupon just for you. Learn about sustainable home building, using mini split heat pumps, insulation, finished carpentry, and more. See all of what's available at courses.finehomebuilding.com and then use the special code PODCAST20 for a discount on any class. That's PODCAST20 in all caps. Thanks for listening. Copper roof uh, that he made on a bay window. Oh, yeah. and I think all thumbs would love that pursuit. And uh, well, it's all true. made with hand and, tools. And, like and your hand five print, grand of them, huh? but and my handprint. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knew true. that until now, <laughs> Kylie. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Green Building Advisor, Senior Editor Kylie Jacques. Hello, everyone. Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor Mike Gurton. Hello. And Senior Producer Jeff Rose. Hi there. Please email your questions to fhbpodcasts at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, Kylie, Mike, Jeff, good to see you all. Thanks for being here this morning. Good to be here. It's nice to be here. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Mike, you're back in uh, Rhode Island? I am. Yep. H- how is it being back in New England after being out in the steamy Southwest? Well, you know, you say the word steamy, which implies humidity, and that's not necessarily the case in the desert it's more like southwest. Crispy, crispy southwest. I, I feel, you know, when I see the temperatures across the nation, and you see, uh, you know, 100 degrees in Southern California or Southern Arizona, that's a big difference than 100 plus degrees in the Midwest or in the South or the Southeast, where the humidity just makes the feel like temperature so much higher. Um, you know, it was the you know, relative humidity where I was was probably in the 35 to 45 percent, except right after a thunderstorm where it goes up a bit. So, yeah, it was tolerable as long as I'm not in the sun. Of course, you know the- I was installing I was telling Jeff earlier, I was installing uh, some R38 fiberglass insulation over my head in a uh, uh, little porch that I'm enclosing and insulating. And uh, it was 103 <laughs> degrees in the room. <laughs> that doesn't sound pleasant. That oh, does not sound boy. pleasant. That know. sounds dangerous, frankly. Yeah. How do you do that without it passing itchy. out? Itchy. Itchy and irritating. <laughs> exactly. Itchy and irritating. The PPE, you know, that you usually wear when you put on the Tyvek suit to put in insulation. Uh. Yeah, you just can't put that. I don't, I don't know how people do it uh, in hot, humid weather and install insulation safely for exactly. their, at least physically safely. It's a, yeah. 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 So, you know, I get these OSHA uh, quick hits, I think they call them in my inbox all the time. Uh, and uh, HVAC techs and other folks who are in crawl spaces and attics in warm places uh, sometimes die or get really oh, sick from it. that work. I believe it. Oh, I believe to it. To be really careful. Yeah. I have And of course, the of- air conditioning quits working on the hottest day, right? And you got to go up and check the air handler. <laughs> right. The iron. Oh. Ugh. I remember what were you uh, saying? Oh, just that when I was a kid, I used to play in this, um, you know, and, and sellers oftentimes the underneath the stairwell will be framed and insulated. I'm not sure why they do that. Maybe originally there was some mechanical equipment in there. But anyway, a friend's house had that situation. So exposed fiberglass backs in a hot enclosed environment underneath a stairwell picture that 
Mm-hmm. And we used Sounds to play awful. in there. That's, that's where the Barbie house was, you know, like that we used to play in there. And I remember coming out and being like, oh, I'm so itchy, you know, and I was just like not understanding it. I, I can't believe our parents let us play down there, but there was just a not, you know, no understanding around how awful that uh, fiberglass. Ooh, yeah. Kylie, well, Gen X, no, one, our parents didn't care, right? As long as you came home with all your limbs, uh, you I know. know. <laughs> I just have to know, though, was the uh, fiberglass, the Owens Corning pink, or was it the Knopf yellow? It was pink. It was Owens Corning. I remember it very well. I used to touch it. I was like, this is like cotton candy. Oh, my gosh. Terrible stuff. (laughs) Terrible. One of my earliest memories is seeing that in the home center with my dad and putting my face on it, just thinking it would be so cuddly. (laughs) And it's like, oh, my God, that was a mistake. (laughs) Well, have you seen some of the marketing of the fiberglass lately? It's like uh, one brand, I think they branded it Eco Touch. It's like this, mm. uh, they're trying to give it that soft, fluffy, um, you know, feeling uh, both huh. physically as well as in their marketing that it's not as itchy as the old stuff, which I do have to admit. So on this insulating project, I had some uh, salvaged probably 1980s, late 80s uh, insulation that we salvaged out of some walls in another building nearby. And I installed that in the walls of this porch enclosure. That stuff was extremely itchy. The Mm -hmm. new stuff, which no formaldehyde, you know, um, binder, it was uh, white, uh, Man- John's Manville, and it was much less itchy. So there is seems to be a difference in today's fiberglass than the what? old. And the earliest stuff is the worst. I think you'd agree. Like the stuff from, I guess it's late sixties or early seventies. Oh my mm, gosh, that's what that I was, is that's really what I was bad. Yeah. But what about some of the newer projects, like uh, products? Like um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, pink. Oh, let me look it up on on GBA. I can't remember the name of the product. Um, what but is it? Insulation. It's insulation, and but my impression is that it is it is a take on fiberglass, but it's it's very new. Um, mm. Hang on, I'll, I'll get back to you. It's okay. been a bit since I saw that article. Jeff, you've been working on insulation. I have not. <laughs> <laughs> you got your railing all done. You feel good? Oh yeah, that, yeah, that's... yeah, yeah. Actually, we're. We scrubbed the deck this past weekend, and now we're trying to we're arranging furniture and exciting things like that out there. Oh, the payoff finally for the yeah. you know nice fall weather, right? That's yeah. fantastic. Yes, I just want to jump back in while we're still close to the topic. Owens Corning introduces pink next generation fiberglass insulation. That's the product. I've used it's, that, and I I. You have? I I agree with Mike. I think the new stuff is better. And yours, Manville, was better too, you say. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's just a newer product to share with people. R15. I think it's a newer process to making it that makes it less mm. horrible. There's still no fun about it, but it's less terrible. Mm. So we have some big news here at the brand. Uh, we are launching the Sustainable Home Building Accelerator uh, e-learning program, and it'll be available for sign up September 4th. And the big news for podcast listeners is there is a uh, coupon, which delights me to give away coupons or anything. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Podcast 20 will get you 20% off. So uh, check that out. And I hope you'll sign up and learn something. And there are a bunch of other uh, courses too. And uh, the coupon works for those too, but don't tell anybody. (laughs) Hey, do you still give, speaking of giving away, do you still give away podcast stickers? Is that still a thing? <laughs> that was so fun. The podcast sticker program is still in lockdown, Kylie. Uh, it's yeah. in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the stickers are in the office somewhere. Yeah. So what is the Sustainable Home Building Accelerator? Yeah. It, it's kind of a, the term doesn't really describe what I'm going to learn when I well, this is a very good Join question, Mike. Um, yeah. I, I'll put a link in the podcast page for those of you who are um, interested, but it's a companion to the best-selling Pretty Good House book. 
It's an interactive online course designed for, to rapidly advance your knowledge of sustainable home design and construction, giving you the information and confidence to design and build a well-crafted, practical house that maximizes performance and comfort. I bet you were dazzled I came up with that off the top of my head. <laughs> Who wrote that? <laughs> um, so, I bet, I bet so basically, Bobby it's the, wrote that. so it's the pretty it's the pretty good house accelerator. Companion. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, okay, it's, okay. okay. It's, so, if, if they would have called it principles. pretty good house, you know, thing, uh, incorporated that into the title, that would have been it would have it would have got my attention right away. That's good feedback, but. Yeah. <laughs> Too late now. I think <laughs> I'll, I'll it was get the marketing team right on that. It wasn't focus test focus group tested the uh, <laughs> term. Well, I think it maybe they want to appeal to a broader crowd with the term sustainable, you know. Yeah. Uh, not yeah, everybody's think, uh, familiar with a pretty good house concept. That's what we I was going to say. Pretty good house is it's not a universal yeah. uh, understood thing. Should be. Yeah. So is this uh, who's who's leading the whole uh, training? Oh my god! I closed the window. Oh, sorry. A n- number of different. I haven't looked into it. So I'm gonna. I guess I'll have to open that link. You yeah. are Mike. You're yeah. supposed to speak. Yeah, you're, right. <laughs> <laughs> you're hosting it. <laughs> oh boy! No, I'm not. No, just to make no, sure not. the podcast people aren't confused. I, 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 I don't have any right. uh, affiliation. No, he's not. With, that was a joke. They're just that was, that was a joke. Yeah, yeah, we do have to be careful when we tell a joke like that. We know <laughs> so it's podcast joke, twenty is not. the the coupon code, folks. I hope you'll check it okay. out. And uh, if you have thoughts on the program, please let us know. Well, as always, uh, we heard from our listeners, and uh, you know, I say it to all my colleagues when we talk about the podcast at brand meetings, but. The feedback we get from listeners and the quest we get is easily the best part of the show. So thank you very much for that. And um, it really makes the show better when you write in. So this uh, comes from Brandon. Uh, For someone to check out LED information, I would recommend uh, this Instagram uh, handle. And I'll put that on the podcast page as well. Uh, I come from the theater industry building scenery and LED systems are very common in this world. I've done several installs for closets as described in the podcast and have also done my own custom cabinet LEDs. It's actually fairly simple if you just want one color. And as with many custom versus prefabricated products, you get a much higher quality finished product, often for less money. Love the show, Brandon. Brandon, thanks for that. So um, it makes sense to me that these are common in the theater world because they're not hot. They're easily hideable, right? Smart. That reminds me of my stagehand days in college. I worked in the theater putting in lights. That was our that was our thing. And they were hot. <laughs> and heavy, pretty, right, Kylie? Uh, yeah, that was a lot of work. That was an interesting job. I did it for – it was very technical. I did it for like three years or something. Um yeah, it delights me to learn that you and I were both on the stage crew, Kylie. Uh, I've done oh, that yeah. work too. I could yeah, see, I could see. You were probably more nerdy. I liked being on the stage. That was part. Of, that was my favorite part. Mostly, <laughs> I held ladders, but it was interesting to learn about the films and the lighting. And one time, I got to run the lighting. Uh, yeah, that was that's cool work. But it anyway, is. that was the you know pre LEDs. It would be. It's I'm sure it'd be a very different scenario today. Hot, but it's heavy. Neat that he's got yeah. that background. I love that. I love that. I always love learning about the interesting thing folks who listen to the podcast do. Yeah. Uh, This comes from Walter. Hello again, podcast cast. I'm a longtime listener and an all access member. Walter, thank you for that. One of the many things I've learned of the many things I've learned. One is that I may be the least skilled DIY person (laughs) in your listening audience. (laughs) Way back in podcast 241, I asked how I could continue to put clay flower pots on my kitchen deck without continuing to rot the boards. After some discussion, you pointed me toward the extensive set of videos that the magazine had about decks. There I found Mike Girton, now favored synthetic deck boards, and that the Vantage Moisture Shield could be tricked into yielding a smooth surface if you countersink the face screws and coax the shavings in over the screw. No tricky hidden connectors, no plugs. Mike's instructions made all this look pretty simple. I have a good cordless drill, a Harbor Freight corded 
oscillating multi-tool, and a selection of hand tools. For my approximately 100 square foot project, I ordered 10 20 foot and one 12 foot boards, three pounds of number seven, two and a half quarter inch stainless screws, as specced by Vantage, and a roll of butyl tape. The North Carolina sun, sun only permitted working on the deck for about five hours a day, but I eventually had a new eight by 10 deck surface and a new treads on the five steps covered in clay pots. Nothing is going to rot now. Discounting my 40 to 50 hours of labor to the customary fine home building DIY rate of zero dollars, <laughs> the cost was 917. Yep. <laughs> I guess the moral of the story is that if you pick a reasonable project, take your time and follow Mike's directions, it should turn out fine. Even if you aren't too skilled to begin with, I'm glad you make stuff that even the non-trades people can follow. Walter, that's, that's an awesome uh, email. Thank you. It, Love yeah. hearing that stuff. Yeah. And he Super sent us fun. a picture of yeah. all of, uh, his new deck and sticks. And yeah, it was great. I, I got to tell you, deck. decks look way better with lots of plants on them than they yeah. do. Uh, yeah. It's like, you know, nice another setup. thing that, that I do, because I, I don't have a synthetic deck. I have a, a wood surface deck and um, my wife has lots of pots on it. And I noticed after, you know, four or five years that where she placed the pots, we we're having trouble with a little bit of decay starting underneath. Luckily, I caught it in time because we take the pots off in the winter, so it becomes obvious. So what I started doing is taking small blocks of um, scrap. Um, Concrete. Uh, nope. Uh, it's uh, just scrap blocks of wood. Uh, like two or three small, like three by three or four by four pieces of wood. And I just set those down and put the pot on top. That lets That's a little smart. bit of air move under it. So that if you do have a wood deck and you don't want to end up with the problem Walter encountered where you leave the pots on, you're watering them all the time. And now you're getting the, you're, you know, accelerating the, the decay of the wood beneath. You can lift them up on just a little pads like that. That's super smart. You know what I used to do? I, I've often had decks and pots, not not as many as he has, but um, I would just align the hole in the pot. Not that this is a real solution, but it helped. I would align the hole in the pot with the seam in the board, you know, the gap. little crack. The gap. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And just let them drain that way. It helps. It's not surefire, but to be cognizant of it anyway. And that's something we do when we do built-in planters. Um, I'll you often line a built-in planter instead of just dropping pots in like the, a, a box that's there on the deck and let them drain down onto the decking that's underneath. If it's a built-in planter, we'll line it with EPDM. In fact, there, I think there's a video of this that uh, Justin Fink I think and so I did. Too. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And we lined it with EPDM and then we um, put in some drain tubes down at the bottom, just some vinyl drain tubes that we uh, drilled holes through the deck boards below and let the drain. So that way you drop a pot in or fill it with some some uh, stone and some uh, filter fabric and then soil, whether the soil is directly in that planter or the pots are, at least you're getting water that's draining through a dedicated hole in the bottom. Like that's you're talking cool, about, uh, yeah. Kylie, where you, the, your pots already have that hole, but you're directing the water where you want it to go and not just letting mm -hmm. it get all over your deck surface. That's so smart. I like Carol's that. been collecting uh, plant stands for a decade or more at yard sales and uh, tag sales and the elephant's trunk. And uh, that's a good way to go, too. And yeah. it's. And then yeah. I don't have to build anything, which is. Awesome. <laughs> and they look cool. Mike, you wrote into the podcast regarding our discussion of uh, modular versus manufactured homes, and uh, you brought up a good point that we, uh, I didn't know this, so do you want to uh, talk about what we missed? Yeah, when uh, Mark and Brian joined you in uh, podcast number 591, you started talking about modular manufactured homes, or what they call HUD code homes. Uh, mobile homes, and you kind of like mixed and matched the differences, and you didn't really zoom in on what those differences are. And what it comes down to is there are two different codes that are involved. If you have a manufactured home, also called a mobile home, also called a HUD code home, those are governed by HUD code, which was developed in the, I think, early 70s, and it's been updated over the years. I think the most recent update by HUD is is a, when it was in 2022, 
Um, so they keep, you know, improving the efficiency, the durability, um, the, the, the structure, uh, how structurally sound they are and so on. Um, if, if you know anything about mobile homes, the ones built many years ago in the 70s, those are the ones that blow away really I, easy. I spent my senior year in one of those, Mike, and I think it was a 1972 model. Yeah. And it was an impossible piece of junk and yep. impossible <laughs> to keep warm in the, in the winter. But they're pretty good now. I think you'd agree. Yeah. Yep, yeah. they are. They've, they've improved them, um, especially with regard to um, with uh, durability side. Um, and efficiency as well. Now that's that's the manufacturer home. Then modular homes, those are governed by the same code that you would have in your local jurisdiction generally. So modular would follow some version of the international residential code. Um, here in Rhode Island, we're following the 2018 international residential code plus Rhode Island has like 40 some odd amendments that the state sort of overlays onto the IRC. So if a mobile home, excuse me, if a modular home is being built in another state and being delivered to Rhode Island, that modular home manufacturer has to follow the Rhode Island amendments plus the IRC version that Rhode Island follows. Hmm. Then the paperwork, well, and then it's inspected there in the state where it's being built by third party inspectors, usually ICC certified inspectors qualifying that it meets Rhode Island amendments plus the IRC, then the paperwork gets sent to the local uh, jurisdiction here in Rhode Island, local city or town. When it comes in, the local inspectors don't inspect the construction of the modules. All they do is they'll just inspect all of the utility connections and the foundation. Now, usually modulars have to be installed on a permanent foundation just like a conventional house. So it's essentially, it's a conventionally built house if you're building it on site. Whereas a manufactured HUD code home will follow those HUD codes, which are different than the IRC. And they may or may not, depending on local uh, regulations, have to be put on a permanent foundation. Although in many cases, they do have to be anchored uh, to the earth in some fashion, maybe some uh, hel helical piles that go down to the earth to keep it tipping over. Uh, just to make them stable. Um, so those are like the, the main differences uh, between them. There are, depending on cities and towns and jurisdictions, and um, some in the past have tried to uh, use zoning to prohibit the use of HUD homes or mod, uh, mobile homes. And uh, they, because local jurisdictions do have land use authority, uh, by either minimum square footage or something like that, or or, or uh, the design of a house. There might be some restrictions for historic districts and uh, just general design features that have to be in homes. Some modular, excuse me, some manufactured homes may not meet those requirements and then therefore wouldn't be allowed. So mm -hmm. they, they can uh, zone them out uh, in, in some zone, mobile homes or manufactured homes from being installed. Uh, and a pe the reason people do this is because they are for folks of uh, limited means, right? And and zoning is often trying to control where poor folks live, right? Yeah. What? Why are the? Do you know the justification of why the HUD code is different from the IRC? I think it's because they have to go over the road, Kylie. These, uh, am I right, Mike? These have to be roadworthy. So the yeah some of the structural differences uh, with a manufactured home is generally you're going to have a metal frame which is the floor first floor the floor level, and that also is the quote unquote trailer that is bringing it to the site. So in their old days you, there'd be an axle underneath that metal frame, the manufactured home would be built on top, and then you drag it to the site because it's called a mobile home. Even though you don't drag it from one site to the next, theoretically, the axle stays under it. The wheels are there. You could, if you remove the skirting, drag it to another site, move it. Um, whereas Can I ask you a oh, go with, ahead. With, with modular homes, those don't have a trailer under them. They're put on flatbed trucks. The frame of the, the floor is, is a wood frame generally, so it's just like a regular house frame. 
uh, and then that's trailered to the site. So it's a difference between manufactured home, HUD code home is the trailer is part of the structure, modular, there's a separate trailer that leaves the site after it's delivered. Okay, independent of modular versus manufactured Yeah. Uh, or mobile. Um, I guess my question is, is HUD housing code different from, like, broadly, you know, like, more broadly speaking, uh, than IRC, the IRC? Yeah. I guess, what I'm, I guess my bottom line question is, is the standard for building HUD housing, which is, like you said, Patrick, for marginalized people, subpar compared to the IRC? That's my real question. I think it, it used to be, Kylie. I think it's way it. less so now, right? Yeah. These have reasonable insulation levels. They have decent windows now. None of these things were present in the one I lived in, for example. It was yeah. a two-by-two two construction with fiberglass bats in between. One side of the two-by-two two was... Uh, I believe it was aluminum uh, panels. On the inside was wood paneling. And you can imagine what a poor air barrier that produced, uh, that, that construction. And I think part of it came from the way the whole, manuf I, I'm speculating here, but the way the whole manufactured home uh, industry developed, it was you know travel trailers back from the post-war era that people would park on a piece of property and start living out of. So a lot of those trailer comp camping trailer companies uh, ended up building these larger and larger units that really weren't going to be hauled from one site to the next, but there was no uniformity because they were, were now being used by people for living continuously rather than just on a camping trip. They wanted to have some uniformity nationwide of these um, structures. Uh, and there was no national code for, there was no IRC at the time. Um, so this could give those manufacturers a way to um, follow a national standard. And they have increased their efficiency, durability, um, healthiness, energy efficiency, I don't know. I've never seen a side-by-side -side comparison to the IRC to see how they stack up. But um, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Maybe. Yeah, it would maybe be. someone in our listening audience knows that what the <laughs> you know R value comparison would be. I'd be curious. U factor, all that stuff. So I think the original sure. intent was to prevent these things from catching fire and to make them not fall apart on the road. And uh, you know, energy efficiency was probably not the emphasis. Let's just say that. This is uh, from Jim, and he has an interesting question that was originally posted on uh, GBA, and I'll put the link to that on the podcast page. This comes from Jim. Hi, all. We're at the dried-in phase of our project in Climate Zone 6, New Hampshire, and getting ready for insulation. We're putting closed cell spray foam in the roof and dense pack fiberglass in the walls. We're still waiting on the sanding seam roof to, and siding to be installed. We have zip roof sheathing and zip R9 wall sheathing all taped. The roof has protective wrap HT underlayment over top as well. I have a few installation details I'm concerned about at this stage, and I'm worried about adding insulation. There is apparently water getting into the assembly in various locations, so much so that the subfloor and some bottom plates and lower studs appear saturated. It seems to dry out between storms. There are fish mouths in the zip tape installation that are gathering water. I can press on some taped areas and the water shoots out. Also, one side of the roof has protector wrap installed horizontally, shingled, and the other side has it installed vertically, overlapped. Why would anyone do that? I'm concerned. How concerned should I be at this stage? The steel roof and siding will obviously be the main layer of defense against the weather, but how resistant should the WRB actually be? Add the complication of the zero overhang design to the roof to the siding detail and the water becomes a real problem. Should I make them retape and re-roll everything again? Should they add a separate WRB on top? Thanks, Jim. Well, should they? What's up, Mike? You're shaking your well, head. I I looked at the photographs that Jim posted on the the Green Building Advisor site, and and there's the, the floor beneath his windows is the, the subfloor is is wet. Um, I've seen this uh, problem where installers who install zip, they think the tape is magic, where you just 
put it near the, the, the zip panels and it's going to just bond 100%. Uh, but if there's any contamination on the surface of zip roof or zip wall panels, you know, if it's got some dust on it, if it's got some mud that's dried and caked on, you can't put the tape over it. You have to clean that surface as clean as it was when it came out of the factory. You know, sawdust that's on there, and this, this, I, well, here's an example. When you, we frame walls, they're laying down and we tilt them up. When they're laying down, they might have sawdust on them. You've got to make sure all that sawdust is gone before you put the zip tape on. Otherwise, it's not going to bond and seal well. So there's lots of things. Plus, it has to, the, lots of things can contaminate the bond between the zip panel, uh, the tape and the zip panel. Then that tape has to be rolled in with a J-roller and it has to be very meticulously pressed on. Um, and if it's not, you don't get a good seal, which is what either of those two, either the contamination or the not having rolled it very well could have caused a problem that Jim's seeing with that fish mouthing. Um, I don't know what zip solution for that is. I would call Huber. Um, I wouldn't count on just telling the contractors to put new tape over it or to peel the old tape off. Um, you're going to want to find out from Huber what their recommendations are and have them execute that according to their uh, re remediation uh, advice there. The not rolling the tape is super common, uh, and I see it peeling off uh, when I'm driving around town. And I'm sure it's labor intensive, and folks just want to get on with their work. But it does not stick unless you roll it. And, he, you know and Huber provides a roller with little H's in it, or Z's, <laughs> excuse me, yep. to indicate that you've rolled it. So when their sales rep comes out and looks at the tape peeling off, they immediately know that someone did not. Uh, follow the directions, and that's why it's peeling. Mike Maines uh, gave a good visual for what that roller with the little Z's does. If you see the Z's, then you know that inside, he said, it's sort of like little glue bubbles that need to be popped in order for it to work. So when you roll it over, you've, you've popped it. I remember Ben Bogey gave a good demonstration on one of the two, at one of the two uh, BS and Beard Connecticut chapters uh, BS and, yeah, that I went to. And he showed, well, first of all, I didn't know what fish mouthing was. So he had to sort of like, well, he demonstrated what that, what, what happens. But essentially his point was if you walk away, he said, if the, if builders walk away, not having rolled the tape, even just overnight, it can make all the difference um, because, you know, temperatures being such and you get those fish mouths in an instant and then you've got this problem. Do you um, want to describe what a fish mouth is, Kylie? That's a good point. We haven't said what that even is. Essentially, when the tape bubbles outward from the <laughs> building and fills with water and so you can – it looks like – you know, a gill filled with water or something. That's I guess. And the worst it, one is I when they're uh, facing up and act as a funnel, right? They're collecting water. Not, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what he showed me. I guess it can happen vertically too, huh? But but yeah. it's most pronounced when it happens with a horizontal taping. Yeah, I would think. So, I would think. So Jim asks, how sh how concerned should he be? Oh yeah, be very yeah. concerned. Absolutely. And yeah, it's not going to get better. <laughs> right. And then he makes the uh, comment, you know, about, well, I'm going to put the roofing on. We're going to have the siding on. How important is this, you know, zip uh, system layer that's on there, both on the roof and on the wall? It's very important. You really want that WRB system to be 100% waterproof. Because whatever your cladding is going to be on the roof of the walls, it's going to leak. And especially if you don't without have, overhangs. Uh, yeah, especially without precisely. overhangs. That is precisely. 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 I've become convinced that overhangs are the solution to so many problems. And like, You're I just absolutely don't understand. right, Kylie. And I don't I think understand building why scientists... houses don't have them. Yeah. What were you going to say, Patrick? You think I was going to say, I think okay. building scientists would agree that you can solve a lot of problems with overhangs and, you know, systems become a lot more redundant naturally if, if you have that protection. Jeff, what and do you think? Would you allow this on your, on your new home build with failing? No, tape? no, it's just, it's just absolutely not acceptable. It does not meet yeah. the standards. It's. And you're paying a lot of money for... says no way. Yeah. You're paying a lot of money for a premium product like yeah. Huber's zip system. And 
show. As we were talking about on a recent after show, it's like, you know, what can go wrong with today's modern building? And this is one of the examples where, you know, it's just not being installed to the manufacturer's installation details. Therefore, it's not meeting the minimum building code. Hmm. Um, you know, minimum building code is following the manufacturer's installation instructions. So, yeah. More than that, it's just not going to work. <laughs> <It's> gonna, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It's not doing what it's supposed to. It's, it's probably doing making it worse. Yeah, and, I yeah, think there's... Your Don't point put about the insulation it. in yet. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah, that's all it. All this and let the building dry out before the insulation goes in. You don't want to insulate a building where there's any moisture that's on the inside until you get that. I, I would actually wait until the finished roof, after the repairs are made to the, the WRB zip system around the, per, you know, the roof and the walls, and then get the cladding on the walls and then get the... Um, the roofing on the roof before putting the insulation in. Some people try to short, uh, try to uh, get the insulation in as soon as possible after the utility, so they can keep working on the inside, and the hopes that that uh, the outside is going to be 100% dry. And yeah, you don't want to have a chance of water getting into that insulation because it's not going to dry out once it gets in there. It would take years to dry once it got wet. Yep. And that's assuming it didn't get wet again, right? That. <laughs> uh, and then the I know some wrap vertically and horizontally. Um, you can install the self-adhered membranes vertically, um, but the manufacturers will have a slightly different installation process, where instead of uh, a four-inch overlap, which is usually from I'm familiar with protector wrap, usually you have a four-inch horizontal overlap. I think you need a six-inch vertical, but it might also be, I haven't looked at their spec lately, it might be a one foot vertical overlap. So you got to double check that. So if they don't have the precise vertical joint overlap, if they ran it from ridge to eave, then that could be done improperly and would need to be uh, either replaced or another layer put on over it. So, And the reason somebody would do this to answer your question, Jim, is that if you're working from a, a ridge hook attached to a ladder, it is far easier to run vertical strips than horizontal because the ladder ends up being in your way and you can't reach out on very far on either side. And uh, installing this kind of roofing, uh, I would think that would be pretty commonplace because the panels run from the ridge to the eave and uh, that's, that would be a way you could install it. It's interesting. So, Mike, are you saying that the tape, um, the width, what is the term that you used? The, the underlayment? Overlap. No, the overlap of the tape on the seams is different oh. if it runs vertically than horizontally. That's exactly. You're if you're running yeah. those sheets of, and this could be for both the self-adhered underlayment, like the protector wrap is. Well, actually, you know, I'm guessing you said on one side they uh, use protector wrap. I doesn't. He, they may, it may not be. It may be a mechanically uh, attached too. In either mm. case, whether it's a mechanically attached, in other words, with nails, cap nails, or cap staples, like a, a like a, a tar paper is equivalency, or if it's a self-adhered type of, of uh, protector hap, wrap brand. In either case, the vertical joints, those when you have a, a lap which is running from ridge to the direction of ridge to eave, those need to be a bigger overlap than they do if they're horizontally when you're running it from rake edge to rake edge. Can you explain why? I think I Because understand. of gravity. Yeah. Uh -huh. when, you, <laughs> yep. when you put because make the seams horizontal, gravity is working in your favor. When right. you put them vertically, you don't have that benefit and uh, you know, you need to make it a better overlap. You buy it, Kylie? No, I'm just understand? trying to picture. I, I'm trying to understand it. It's like I imagine it has to do with like the entry, the entry span that water has to get in the so top what, from top what down versus what vertically. happens I'm when sorry. you have it when you have the joints horizontally? You're you're basically shingle lapping them. Right. One's yeah, over so the other, so it, everything's going to slope downhill. It's unlikely, unless there's wind blowing, to go uphill. Whereas if it, when it's a vertical joint, the water will, of course, go right. follow vertically by gravity, but it can move horizontally with just a very minimal amount of wind or just by capillary action. 
Mm-hmm. Or if yeah. there's a little wrinkle in the underlayment, it can actually channel mm-hmm. it toward the seam. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we haven't talked water. about the after show yet, but now's the time for that. So, Mike, do you want to talk about your plans to build a new home and uh, our discussion in the after show? Well, we won't discuss my new home necessarily, but what we're going to what we're going to discuss is um, so I built the house I'm in about 30 years ago, and I want to dump it. <laughs> <laughs> so you would. So I built my forever house 20. 27, 28 years ago, you know, planned out the design really well, thought had everything figured out for the forever house. But now after living in it for years, plus the mistakes that I made when I was building it, I don't want to, as I get older, I don't want to be <laughs> burdened with the things that are wrong. So we'll talk about all the things I did wrong when I built my house and that, that I'm going to change in the new house, both from the design standpoint. And one of those we already mentioned, big overhangs. Overhang. <laughs> this is a great article idea, too. Yeah. This is a great article idea. Lessons and, learned. Uh, the yeah, lessons what will learned. we call it? Your, your really forever house? You, you really <laughs> right, made right. a forever house? Uh, is is yeah, there a well, forever house? <laughs> at, at my age, I don't, if, if it, you know, if I built another house and I, I tolerated it for another 30 years, I think that's the, ex- I mean, I'd be <laughs> lucky it. to get You're done. 30 You're years done. out of yeah. this life. Well, that should be good. Good conversation. I uh, I look forward to talking to you about that. You know, I think um, you're uh, having built it yourself uh, is is really interesting because most folks, you know, get their forever house built or buy it or whatever, and you know, you got to make all the decisions yourself. And we'll see how how you did, right? So it's only you only have yourself to blame. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know how many times I kick myself in my rear end every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to and hearing so, what mistakes you think you made. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm curious. And what yeah. worked well too, because I think folks will find yeah, that equally there's a valuable. Few things sure. that worked well. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, uh, another Mike has got um, a house being built, and he says I have a crew about to put in thirty-two thousand dollars worth of new windows. I spoke with the Anderson window rep from my area about the installation plan. And considering I'm using Prosoco, am I saying that right, Prosoco? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, WRB products, liquid flashing for the entire house. He was okay with sealing the entire perimeter of the window, including the bottom window flange. I understand the logic of providing an escape path in the event of a window failure, but considering the windows are warrantied for a decade, I'm leaning towards sealing them so that I see water damage that on the drywall returns and know I have a window that's compromised. Is this a good plan? This was also on GBA that I mined because I thought it was a really interesting uh, conversation. There's still disagreement on whether you should tape the bottom flange of flanged window window installations when you're um, managing water. Uh, I've heard you want to leave that open so it can drain. Uh, What do you think about Mike's plan? It it seems like all the high-performance builders are very much in favor of leaving that open. Um, Josh Salinger of Birdsmouth Design Build weighed in on that thread, um, and he he wrote, "Never seal the exterior bottom side of the window flange. You do not want the um, seal at the bottom. Sloping the sill is best practice. You flash three sides, leave the bottom open, and air seal on the interior. I thought that was interesting. Air seal on the interior. Um, let the sill pan drain by sloping the rough sill. Mike Maines also weighed in, and I always trust what he has to say. And he said, I usually do this by sloping the rough sill rough sill, um, but I'm also fine with a level sill and a back dam. What I'm not okay with is this, uh, and think is a waste of time, is the typical approach of using a membrane sill pan with no slope or back dam. In this case, it's not doing anything. So those two guys- And it's also a huge air leak, I'm guessing too, right? If you don't put a back dam of of something, uh, you know, the air is just going to blow from the inside under the window to the, uh, or from the outside- inside under the window or vice versa, depending on the season. So one of the things that struck me right away, because I clicked on the link to the GBA Q&A forum thread to read through it, is right here, you, you've got, so Mike posted the question on GBA, 
And he got an answer from Malcolm Taylor. He got an answer from Mike Maines. He got a, an answer from Josh Challenger for free. Come on. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> I mean, think right? about it. The, I know. If you were to hire a consultant to come out and kind of review the process and, and, you know, questioning whether something was right or wrong, you'd be paying hundreds or thousands of dollars. And here he got like gold just mm-hmm. for free. Within and, a day. Yeah. Within a, Within a day. day. Yeah. That's what makes GBA so successful. It, That's exactly know, what it is. It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. And I don't think people realize who are asked questions on GBA the value of the responses that they get mm-hmm. um, in, in do, that regard. Yeah. And, and from I, luminaries in the business. Th- th- these are right. not yo, uh, you know, Joe Sixpack, uh, right? right? These are right. folks who know what <laughs> they're no, doing. The, yeah, yep. the, the people who know what they're doing, they've been on GBA for the last, uh, you know, at least 10 or 15 years, and they've they've had experience in the field. So, yeah, you can't yeah, you can't pay for that point. kind of knowledge. Um, the it's interesting that uh, when <laughs> that Mike points out that the windows are warrantied for a decade. A decade goes by like this. <laughs> and that's, true. that's yeah. something that, you know, living in the house I'm in, you know, that I built, I'm realizing that, uh, yeah, I'll put, you know, it, it, it'll it last for 20 years. And I think, but now looking back, that went by, the last 30 years have gone by in a flash. Um, you can't count on what the windows are warranted for. You want to plan for things to degrade and those windows even though the warranty for a decade will probably be there a lot longer than that so having some of that resiliency in having that flashing pan at the bottom are going to be a little extra step that's going to be well warranted for the long term what i find interesting is uh, I recall that at one point, most window manufacturers wanted you to tape the bottom. And you're nodding, Mike, so you agree. Yeah. This is not something I imagined. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's what they do. It, well, see, there's a ASTM E2112. It's a standard for window and door installation. It kind of parallels the AMA guidelines, which now has a new name. I forget what they call it now. But it, it, it's... It allows for face sealing, which is what Mike's talking about, and what the the Anderson rep said would be would be adequate. It allows for face sealing. Um, now, don't quote me on this, but I've gotten the feet. Well, I'm here. I am on a podcast, so I'm going to be quoted over and over again. But <laughs> I have a I have a feel over. I've seen a lot of Anderson reps recommend face sealing, whereas when I talk to other manufacturer window manufacturers reps they recommend uh sill pans i don't know why i hear more anderson reps telling it's uh, recommending the face sealing approach um other than that both it, it is an allowed approach um but it's one that is suspect for long-term dur- durability yeah, I don't think I've seen a GBA post uh, series of responses that were so uh, consistent in their advice. Yeah, yeah right. It is rare. It is, yeah. It is, yeah, it's rare. There's usually some debate, but yeah, that seems to there, be across the board. There is the a climate aspect to this. Um, if you're mm-hmm. in an area that doesn't get much rain, then face sealing isn't going to be as problematic as areas that are going to get uh, a, a fair amount of rain. Now, Mike's actual uh gba handle is mike from the mountains of utah (laughs) so i'm wondering if in the mountains of utah where he is it doesn't get a lot of rain so perhaps you know if if i knew it was only getting 12 or 14 inches of rain a year and that there might have been uh some uh, overhangs on the building then i might agree with the um with the uh face ceiling because it's not going to be as prone to problems. So what? a lot of our a lot of our experience is with uh, more wet areas of the country, and that's where uh, we tend to. You know, like I know Josh is up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Mike is up in Maine. Uh, I'm not sure where Malcolm is from, uh, and we're from the Northeast. He's so, from Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. So probably higher higher uh rain areas where it's more important to have that um 
that sill pan in there because you know that eventually something's going to leak, but maybe not so Good. much in the mountains of Utah. Here's another argument for overhangs. Yeah. Right? Well, that's true. I, you know, and I think you have to plan for the worst possible scenario. And even in dry places, they get blowing thunderstorms uh, once in mm -hmm. a while. And, you know, uh, you can have a, just one event that soaks the inside of your walls and you got a much bigger problem than if you would have let the window drain. That's, yeah, that's a really a good point, Patrick, point. because, uh, yeah, wind driven rain is so different. I remember when I had my house, um, there were types of storms that would cause, um, a, like a mushroom vent. There was leakage from that into my cedar lined closet, but it was only with specific types of events. It didn't happen every yeah. time. It wasn't just plain rain. It had to be coming in from a certain direction. So that is a good point. I wonder how many of the homes that recently experienced that tropical storm that hit through San Diego, LA, and up through the Central Valley of California, which are all typically dry areas, experienced that, that, that and a storm like that hasn't gone through that region in about 85 or 90 years. I'm wondering how many of the homes built in the past 85 or 90 years who, that have not experienced water leaks around windows and doors did it, indeed experience window leaks due to the wind-driven rain. So, If any of you listeners out there in Southern California have experience with this, this storm, I would love to hear what happened to your yeah. house because I am betting that they are not built to withstand those kind of conditions. Exactly. Which is why builders today building new houses need to be incorporating strategies for changing weather patterns, right? Good building point. more resilient yeah. Yeah. When I think about the mission of fine home building going forward, that's what I always come back to. We need to teach people. We've taught them how to build houses that don't fall down and decks that don't fall down. But to make buildings more resilient, I think, is our next uh, challenge. And uh, mm -hmm. it seems like we can't get going fast enough. Good uh, after show topic. That is. Making buildings more resilient. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. Yeah. Best practices. This comes from the FHB forum, uh, All Thumbs, and uh, it's a great segue to remind you folks to become Fine Home Building All Access members. Uh, you get the archive, you get to uh, see our videos and all the things that we've done over the years to help people build good houses. So check that out. And if uh, you are an All Access member, thanks for that and uh, stay tuned for the after show. But so this comes from All Thumbs. He says, I had the roof replaced on my house last year and the roofers did a fine job, but the roofing on the bay window is not great. The roofers removed some clapboard and tucked the roofing up under it and then reattached it. The clapboards in this part of the house are not in great shape. And then there's the caulk the roofers used to fill the nail holes. My fall project is to replace the clapboards and make sure the entire roof area is well flashed. Should I install kickout flashing where the roof meets the side of the house? And if so, should I go with metal or plastic? The roof on the bay window does not have a good pitch for drainage. And I live in Maine, but the windows above will not follow, allow for much slope in this area and would also be against code according to the roofer. So I want to flash it as aggressively as possible. Oh my gosh, aggressive flashing. That's also <laughs> a good after show topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, any advice on kick out flashing for this spot? Identical on either side would be helpful. Thanks. Mike, you're the guru of kick out flashing. I'm going to let you launch right into this. So the um, all thumbs, the photographs that he had on the uh, fine home building forum, uh, it, it, it's not what I think of as a, 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 a bay window where it's just uh, bumped out maybe like, you know, 12 or 16 inches. This looks like a full floor to ceiling bump out of about two and a half or three feet from what I could guess. So it's a, it's a substantial roof. Um, for a small bay window that's just, you know, you know three feet or four, four feet high and it just bumps out a few inches, kick-out flashings probably, yeah, you could put them on, but it wouldn't necessarily be uh, any great advantage because there's not a lot of water coming off of that small roof. But on all thumbs roof, because it's much bigger, there's probably a lot more water. And it looks like a fairly low pitch, uh, like he mentioned. It's a fairly low slope on there. So anything you can do to get the, the flashing higher behind the cladding, behind the siding, is a good idea, and the kick-out flashings. Now, the, 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 it's an angle bay window setup, so most of the manufactured 
kickout flashings are designed for a 90 degree intersection where the eave edge of the overhang of a roof meets a wall. Um, so I don't know if you if he's going to be able to find a manufactured plastic or metal flashing which is going to work real well. It's probably going to end up having to be a custom made one. And there are uh, some uh, instructions on the fine home building site. I think Andy Angle did a, a little uh, mastered in a minute uh, a number of years ago on making a kickout flashing and bending it with a pair of hand seamers from one piece of um, uh, aluminum flashing. So I looked to that or, or another resource. So you could build it to match the angle uh, of the roof to wall intersection so that it doesn't look too obtrusive. Um, so metal or plastic, both are good. At least uh, six inches behind your cladding, that would be ideal. And if you can get it behind whatever the WRB is on the wall, that would be the best. I'm going to suggest that all thumbs go to finehomebuilding.com and look up Andy Grace's recent uh, copper roof uh, that he made on a bay window. Oh, yeah. And I think all thumbs would love that pursuit. And uh, that's it's all true. made with hand and, tools, and, and, like and your hand five print, grand of them, um, but. And my handprint. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody Shinter. knew that until now, Tyler. <laughs> oh, no, you shared that on a podcast. I, I'm sure of it. That's how I learned it. Um, um, Alexandra Basic uh, uh, also has a good detail drawing that comes from, you know, Steve's firm. Um, it's something that they use there regularly. It's very complicated. I'm not going to try to sum it up here, but um, it's a great illustration um, for reference. Uh, and I can and, share the and link. This to is that. on GBA. We'll put the link yeah. to the on the podcast page, right, Kylie? Yep. Yep. I think this is real important, and I I've seen a lot of rotted uh, clapboards at this intersection where uh, bay roofs meet sidewalls, and uh, mm -hmm. you know it's because it's not flashed correctly. Yeah, uh, I noticed more... that water damage on houses as I have become more familiar with these issues. You see that fairly regularly. I do. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And on, um, on, on, and on rolled tape on, on zip panels, you see that regularly too, because now I look carefully. <laughs> it's an <laughs> illness, sitting, right, Kylie? I'm, once you know. <laughs> I was at a stop sign and I see a house, you know, sheath and zip. I'm like, hmm, I look to see what the tape looks like. <laughs> I bet we all do that. You too, right, Jeff? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's fun. And, and most of the time, you, you're disappointed, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, ask my own question here. I'm currently assigned uh, a fine home building article on home EV charging because it was of my own interest. And uh, the worst thing you can do is express an interest at fine home building, and then you're assigned a feature <laughs> article. Um, but Or the best uh, thing. Yeah, it's, it, it, it does interest me. Um, so, you know, I'd like to ask listeners who have a, a level two or three charging system at home to describe what you have. Is it hardwired? Does it plug in? I've learned recently that most of these things are now plugged into a dryer receptacle and it allows you to move and take the thing with you because they cost hundreds of dollars minimum. And uh, it used to be, I'm pretty sure, that these had to be hardwired according to uh, the NEC. I don't know if that's changed or if the... Um, the chargers themselves are uh, UL listed to uh, allow them to be, you know, a, a plug-in appliance. I'm sure there are way more knowledgeable people out there who listen to this show on this subject. So I'm appealing to you uh, if you would get in touch with the podcast email box about your knowledge or experience with these things. I'd be grateful. Is this interesting, you, Mike? Kylie? Yeah. Are you thinking yeah. about putting one in? I actually asked Scott Gibson to write a piece, um, what to know about electric vehicles, and he did. Um, so that's worth looking at uh, for this reader. I'll also put a link in there. But um, The reader's me. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. But this is your question. I thought you, I thought you were just rephrasing it as something you were no, also No, no. This is, this, like, this is ah, an assignment okay. I have, yeah. Well, check out Scott's article, what to know about electric vehicles. That's good research fodder. But uh, are you thinking – so you're thinking about putting one in, Patrick? I can't afford an electric vehicle, Kylie, but I am interested yeah. in the technology because uh, I love cars. So I think that's the way we're all going. Mike, uh -huh. how about you? Does this my, interest you? Well, my, my wife bought 
uh, an EV. She wanted one for years, and we waited and got a good deal on one, actually, just before the pandemic pricing went through the roof on, on all vehicles. And I put in a level two charger. Um, couldn't put in a level three because you need to, you need the three phase or, or greater mm. for that. So you got to be along a commercial corridor to get that kind of power. So we're limited to a level two. Um, cost me, I shopped around for quite a while looking at what you were talking about, Patrick, whether it was going to be hardwired or something plugged in. I wanted something I could plug in and it was a, a dryer or a range outlet. I forget, but it was a, a 40 amp model, uh, put in a double pole breaker. I put in a 240 volt switch because mm. I wanted to be able to leave it plugged in all the time and any, um, uh, phantom uh, electricity that it would just draw while it was not plugged into the car. I wanted to eliminate that. So I put in the 240 volt switch, the uh, eight gauge wire, all told um, with the all the accessory stuff, which is about a hundred bucks, you know, between the plug, the wire, all that. Um, about 250 for the a decent uh, level two charger and about two hours to wire it all up. And yeah, wow. works great. What That's car did you get? She got uh, a, a Hyundai Kona, uh -huh. which is like a, a mini oh, SUV uh, style. It gets about 300 miles on a charge. Mom, and I did, awesome. I, did the, I did the calculation, and we're in a very high electric rate here in southern New England. Uh, we pay about 26 or 28 cents a kilowatt hour. And... Uh, it costs it, it. It costs about. Uh, it's equivalent to the way I did the calculation: a dollar, a dollar forty per gallon of gas. In other words, when I did the cost conversion. So, unless gas gets below a dollar forty, it's cheaper to run the EV. And you're saving but, the planet and have a new car, <laughs> which seems like the best possible scenario. I think previous. I yeah. think previously owned hybrids are the way to go. I think that's how I'm going to get my first. Yeah. Hybrid. I'll probably get a hybrid. I think it's a good idea. Or, yeah. yeah. Well, I bet this is a great topic for an after show, too. We're just like banging them out of the park with after show ideas today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, stay tuned for the uh, members only after show. We're going to talk about Mike's not so forever house. And uh, <laughs> if you're a member, thank you very much for that. If you're not, I hope you'll consider it. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mike, Kylie, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep Craft Alive. Thanks very much for listening. Bye.